This is Prevailing With Ministries. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us here today on our uh, live Bible study on the red heifer and Passover. It's very important that we understand from the biblical text, but also from a couple of sources perhaps we may not have considered. And so let's pray and then we'll get right into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished or equipped unto every good work. We thank you, Father, that your word tells us that the scriptures, that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and that no creature is hidden from your sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We thank you, Lord, that your word also tells us that we are to know that wisdom is the principal thing and in, and get wisdom and in all you're getting, get understanding. These things we thank you for in Jesus name. Amen. There's a lot of uh, uh, buzz, if you will, concerning the red heifer that it is going to be uh, sacrificed at the time of Passover. And uh, for us that are believers, as far as the New Testament is concerned, those of us that are believers in Christ, uh, some of us do have a grasp on what these events actually mean. Uh, and I do have to admit that I'm, I've recently come into some information uh, that will help us to understand what these events mean and what we're really experiencing. And so we have to understand it from not only from the Bible in terms of the biblical text, but we also have to understand it from the standpoint of Hebrews, uh, from the Hebrews. So uh, the red heifer and Passover, the uh, red heifer actually comes from two passages of scripture that we will see in uh, the book of Numbers and also in the book of Genesis chapter 19. So let's get right into this here in the uh, book of uh of uh, Numbers uh, chapter 19, beginning at verse one. Now the people, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord has commanded saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eleazar, the priest, that he may take it outside the camp and it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eleazar, the priest shall take some of its blood with its finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, if you don't know what the tabernacle tabernacle of meeting is, uh, if you, if you go back into the time that the children of Israel was uh, out of Egypt, and as soon as they entered into a particular spot, the Lord instructed Moses to make a tabernacle. Now, this was a portable tabernacle because of what would take place as far as the 12 spies is concerned. Ten of them brought back a bad report and two only brought back a good report. And that's Joshua and Caleb. And so the tabernacle of meeting was a portable tabernacle in which the Levitical priesthood would be in charge of the service of the tabernacle. And so uh, when they entered into the promised land, they still had this portable tabernacle all the way up to David. And it was in David's heart to build a temple. But because he had too much blood on his hands, meaning the killing of Uriah and also his warfare, uh, it was given to his son Solomon, which was born out of Bathsheba and whom David had committed adultery with. But nonetheless, uh, now that a permanent tabernacle was built, the performance of the sacrifices would be performed in the uh, first and second temple and uh, the uh, ter uh, the temple of Herod or Herod's temple would be destroyed in A.D. 70. And, and so uh, that's the background in terms of the tabernacle of, of meeting, which you can get further information about this in the book of Hebrews chapter 9. All right, verse 5 here in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its offal shall be burned. 
And the priest shall take the seed of wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire burner burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, he shall bathe in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening. And the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, bathed in, bathe in water, and shall be unclean until evening. Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place, and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel. For the water of purification it is for purifying from sin." And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be clean until evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who dwells among them. He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, then he will be clean. But he, but if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. Whoever touches the body of anyone who has died and does not purify himself defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. That the person shall be cut off, that person shall be cut off from Israel. He shall be unclean because the water of purification was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still on him. This is the law when a man dies in the tent. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which has not cover fastened on it is uncleaned. Unclean. Whoever is in the open field touches one who is slain by a sword or who has died or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person, they shall take some of the ashes of the heifer burnt for purification from sin and running water shall be put on them in a vessel. A clean person shall take his up and dip it in the water, sprinkle it on the tent, on all the vessels, on the persons who were there and on the one who touched the bone, the slain, the dead or a grave. A clean person shall sprinkle the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on and and on the seventh day he shall purify himself, wash his clothes and bathe in water and that and at evening he shall be clean. But the man who is unclean and does not purify himself, that person shall be cut off from among the, the assembly because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of purification has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. It shall be a perpetual statute for them. He who sprinkles the water of purification shall wash his clothes. And he who touches the water of pur purification shall be unclean until evening. Whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean. And the person who touches it shall be unclean until evening. So I wanted to read that because I know that many of us, when we read scripture, we just want to cut right to the chase. And there's a time for that. But in this uh, particular text, we do need to cover and read the entire text so that way you will not be without knowledge. Here in the book of Genesis chapter 15 is where we get the first reference of the heifer. Here beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly re great reward. But Abram, Abram said, Lord, God, what will you give me, saying, I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer uh, of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Now, I want to go back and show you this because this is very important that we understand the word Abram, because the word Abram means high father or exalted father. Now, remember when he his name was changed, his name was changed from Abram to Abraham 
which is the father of many nations. But where did Abraham come from? And the, and, and when we look this out, and I'm gonna do, I should have done a, a study on this and, 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 and made a reference. But if you look at the word Hebrew, uh, you, you will see that it, it has a, a great uh, reference in terms of where Abraham actually came from. So here uh, I'm pulling up a reference, and, and if we were to look at the word uh, he, uh, Hebrew uh, uh, and, and study this out uh, completely, we will see that we will find a, a significant reference. Here the word Hebrew simply means a descendant of Eber. If you were to go back into Genesis chapter 10, you will see a genealogy and Eber or an Eberite was from the land of Ur of the Chaldees. And this word Eber means one from beyond, one from beyond. And, and that's, and that's very powerful in terms of where Abraham came from. So he came from Eber and uh, this means one from beyond. And that's very powerful. Uh, so now we're getting a, a good understanding as far as, uh, where Abram, who now is Abraham, where he had came from. So now uh, look at verse four here. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, uh, rather, rather said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and it accounted to, and he, meaning God, accounted it to him for righteousness. We see this same reference in the book of Galatians. And I hope this reference is, is there here in the book of Galatians chapter three and beginning in verse six, it says, just as Abram, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying in you all of the nations shall be blessed you will remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 28 and verses uh, 19 and 20 that we are to make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit but here in the uh, in verse nine now, so then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So uh, uh, again, verse five, I didn't, I didn't read that. Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that's very important that we understand that part. All right. Verse seven. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. So that way we see what Eber means. And that is one that that is brought from beyond Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, uh, Lord God, how shall I know I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three year old heifer. So that's where we get the reference of in terms of the three year old heifer. Many of you that have studied, studied out the red heifer to some degree. We now have a biblical reference as to what God requires as far as the red heifer is concerned, which is found in the book of Genesis chapter 15 and verse nine. So it's very important that we put these things together and put scripture together so that way we can understand it. I believe that what, what we need to do is that when we hear of certain things as as far as the red heifer is concerned, we need to go back to its scriptural uh, 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 origin and define it that way so that we can have a better understanding as far as what we're seeing portrayed today. So verse nine again. So he said to him, bring me a three year old heifer, a three year old female goat, a three year old ram, a, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And uh, then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the in a land that is not theirs, meaning Egypt, 
and will serve them and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward. They shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, meaning that he will die and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark and that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between two pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And if you have a map, you will see that the river Euphrates cuts right into Iraq. And so Israel was supposed to have all that land all the way up to the Euphrates River. The, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, uh, the Kenizzites, I hope I pronounced that correctly, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so that would be the people that would be residing in the territory, which now today, of course, is uh, a part of uh, Saudi Arabia. Then further you go into Iraq and so forth. But notice that this is where the origin of the red heifer had come from. So now what is all this about in terms of the red heifer? Well, if we were to pull up some references, we will begin to see that this coincides with what's happening with the Passover. Now, uh, there is a difference in dates as far as the Passover is concerned. And so I believe that we need to go back to the to the uh, definitions of in terms of uh, the uh, the Hebrews and begin to see what this is all about. So if we were to pull this up, we will begin to see that there is a big difference as far as dates are concerned that we need to uh, understand because once we we begin to understand all of these things, then we will begin to see that uh, there is some significance here. So so now we see a title here. It says an early Easter, late Passover. Here how here's how the moon is messing with the holidays, and this is very important. Uh, and, and I you know it, when I read this, this was very powerful. Those celebrating religious holidays such as Easter, Passover, Ramadan, and 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 Holly, I, th- I believe that's the correct uh, pronunciation. May notice uh, 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 celebrations are a little off schedule in 2024. For uh, one, the Christian holiday uh, Easter lands on March 31st. This year, almost a week after uh, a week and a half earlier than last year's Resurrection Sunday. It also marks the first time in eight years the occasion hasn't been celebrated in April, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. The Jewish community, I hope I don't get a a copyright strike. If I do, then I'm in trouble. Uh, The Jewish community is experiencing the opposite phenomenon with Passover getting an especially late start on April 22nd, 2024. Over two weeks later than the 2023 celebration and a week later than in 2022. But why? According to the Farmer's Almanac, both Easter and Passover follow a schedule that aligns with the phases of the moon and the sun's position in the sky known as the lunisolar calendar. The Farmer's Almanac refers to these holidays as movable feasts. Each holiday has its own set of rules, and the first moon of spring, the Pascal full moon, determines them. The Hindu holiday Holi, which is spelled H-O-L-I, is also based on a lunisolar calendar. And we'll see a significantly later celebration date in 2024 as well, uh, uh, starting on March 25th, over three weeks later than in 2023 and a week later than in 2022, as opposed to lunar solar uh, calendars, which aim to remain synchronous 
With both the solar year and phases of the moon, lunar calendars usually start each month with a new moon of the first visible crescent moon after the, after the new moon. A lunar calendar is about 354 days composed of 12 lunar months and measures the, the time it takes the moon to pass through its phases. A lunar moon, uh, a lunar month rather, is about 29.5 days long, creating a one long one year lag between solar and lunar calendars every 33 years, according to the Al, according to Al Jazeera, which is, of course, a terrorist organization. So we, you know, we <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, 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 through still determined by phases of the moon, the Muslim holiday Ramadan, which, of course, Christians don't celebrate, is based on a lunar calendar and Jews as well. This year, Ramadan began on March 10th and ends and April 9th, nearly two weeks earlier than in 2023. When is Easter the Gregorian calendar? Easter is the Christian celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. We do not celebrate Easter. It is a, a goddess, so Christians do not celebrate Easter. So don't, don't assume that I celebrate Easter. I don't. Uh, it's the resurrection of Christ. There's a big difference. Uh, uh, Western practicing Christians always celebrate Easter the first Sunday after the first full moon of this sp of spring. Again, I want to point out that we just don't. I'm just reading the article here. I don't celebrate Easter, nor do I endorse it. So uh, just be very careful. Now, don't attach me to anything and say, well, see, he he celebrates Easter with none of hold your horses. I don't. All right. It occurs sh shortly after the first day of spring, otherwise known as the vernal equinox. The earliest it can ever occur is March 22nd and the latest is April 25th, according to the Farmer's Almanac. This year, the Pascal full moon lands on Monday, March 25th, hence the 2024 Sunday, March 31st celebration day, which of course is next Sunday. If the first spring full moon falls on a Sunday, Easter is celebrated the following Sunday. So you see what they're trying to do. They're trying to force us to celebrate Easter and to force us to celebrate the resurrection of, of, uh, of Christ on their Easter Gregorian calendar date. So that gets us confused. And that's why we don't do that. We celebrate uh, the, uh, the Passover as far as Christ is concerned, you will notice that the scriptures in the New Testament said that Christ is our Passover. So, uh, again, I want to make sure that you understand very clearly that Christians, true born again Christians, do not celebrate Easter. So the last time Easter landed on March 31st was in 2013, according to the census, U.S. Census Bureau. And the next time Easter will land on this date is over half a century from now in 2086 and again in 2097. When are Christian holidays in 2024? Epiphany, Good Friday, Easter, you see the dates there. All right, so, but now we get to the Passover, which is very significant here. When is Passover and other Jewish holidays? Hebrew calendar. Passover or Pesach, I believe that's correct, the correct he, correct. Hebrew pronunciation. If I butchered it, please forgive me. I don't know Hebrew. I should know how to pronounce it. I know you're not going to cut me any slack, but please cut me some slack. Uh, uh, Hebrews uh, com uh, commemorates the slavery of the Israelites in Egypt and their ultimate exodus to freedom. And so that's why there is a difference, because on the Hebrew calendar, we're going to see that the Lord instructed the children of Israel that on the first day, this will be the first uh, the first month for you. But on the 14th day would be the Passover. And so that's why the dates are distinguished and different from each other. And, and that's why we need to just sit down and relax and study it and read it, even though it is tough to understand. Yet we just need to read it and accept it for what it is. According to the California based Peninsula Jewish Community Center, this story of redemption from slavery is the master story 
of the Jewish people and has shaped Jewish consciousness and values. It is celebrated for seven or eight days because although Jews left Egypt on the first day of Passover, they were pursued by the Egyptians until the parting of the Red Sea, which occurred seven days according to a uh, Kabad organization. In the in 2024, Passover starts at nightfall on April 22nd. So uh, I, I because I didn't study this out, I always assumed that the Passover would be on the day that Easter is celebrated, which is the Resurrection Sunday. But then if you go back and study this out in terms of the lunar calendar, you will see that in this particular uh, instance that the Passover is celebrated on the 14th day of Nisan, uh, which is the first month of the year for the children of Israel. And 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 so that's the the proper uh, aspect that we should look at this. So again, in 2024, Passover starts at nightfall on April 22nd and ends on April 29th or 30th. Every month follows the phases of the moon and every year follows the Earth, Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, now, just in case you don't understand this, I looked up this uh, particular calendar, uh, it, it, as you can see here, uh, and, and you will see that on Monday, 22nd, April 2024, it equals the 14th day of Nisan, 5784, which is the uh, the, the 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 year that the uh, the Jews were in existence. And so this calendar really opened my eyes up to the fact that the Gregorian calendar and the Jewish calendar are two separate and different calendars. And that the dates as far as the, the Passover is celebrated always, always, as far as the Passover is concerned, it is always celebrated on the 14th day of Nisan. And, and so there's no way around it in terms of the different different dates in which the uh, the Passover is celebrated. So we need to pay more attention to the 14th day of Nisan than on what the Gregorian calendar uses to celebrate Easter coinciding with what they they say is the resurrection of Christ. But see, the thing is, is that Christ died on the 14th day of Nisan. He was sacrificed on the day of Passover, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, the 14th day of Nisan, not on Easter Sunday, on, according to the Gregorian calendar. So we got to be very careful in terms of, of the of the dates in which uh, these uh, individuals are bringing, because it can be a, a slightly deceptive way of showing that Christ wasn't the Passover, but Christ was our Passover and he was sacrificed on the cross on the 14th day of Nisan. There's no getting a way around it, because if you were to study the scriptures as far as the day in which Christ was uh, crucified, you will see that he was crucified on the day of Passover. That's, of course, the book of Matthew, chapter 27 and, and in other references of the scripture. So now what, the, what does this red heifer uh, mean in terms of sacrificing? Well, a lot of people are, say, are saying that there is a great significance that the that if you have the red heifer, there has to be a temple. Now, you don't have to have a temple to sacrifice the red heifer. But nonetheless, uh, there is word that they will sacrifice this red heifer on this coming Passover, which is not this Sunday coming up as far as the the Gregorian calendar is concerned, but a little further down the down the road in terms of April 22nd and so forth. So uh, so it's going to be a little bit later. So when you see them sacrificing the red heifer on those days, you're going you're going to say, well, why didn't they sacrifice the, the red heifer on on Easter on the Gregorian calendar? Well, here's the reason why. Look at this date. It's the 14th day of Nisan, which coincides with Monday, April 22nd. So that's the thing that we have to be very, very uh, cognizant about. And so uh, this brings us to one particular thing as far as uh, the, um, the coming of the Lord is concerned. A lot of people are saying that the coming of the Lord is very near. And that is true. I mean, it's nearer than when we first believed in the book of uh, Romans chapter 13, where Paul says that is nearer than when we first believed. 
But one of the things that we have to understand also is that the Lord is long suffering towards us and that uh, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the Lord has a heart of long suffering because once he uh, once he establishes the day of the Lord and this already established, it's not it's not that once he establishes the day of the Lord is already established, according to the book of uh, Acts, chapter 17 and verses 30 and 31. For he has established the day in which he will judge the world by that man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the date is already established, but we don't know when that date will be. And so as far as the red heifer being sacrificed, and I know that uh, there's only been nine red heifers uh, that were sacrificed from the time starting from Moses up until uh, this particular time. But now they're saying, according to uh, Jewish tradition, that if there is a 10th red heifer sacrifice, then the Messiah would appear. We don't know. We we can't say for certainty that this will take place. But nonetheless, there are two things that the Lord told his believers to do. Uh, actually, three. Watch. That's number one. Pray. That's number two. And three. Be ready. And, and so what if that day comes and the Lord doesn't come and, and disappoints a whole lot of people? Well, a whole lot of people are going to be disappointed. I, I uh, uh, equate that to the fact that the Lord is long suffering not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He always give man a lot of latitude to repent of sin, just like what we read in the passage of scripture in the book of Genesis chapter 15, that the sins of the, of the Amorites were not full. Well, the sins of the whole world is not full as well, but he knows the date that it will. And when he does, he will now initiate the pouring out of his wrath. Now, those of you that are in Bible study and studying out the last days, you know exactly how all of this may uh, play at itself out according to the scriptures. The book of Daniel chapter two gives us the timeline in which four uh, empires will come to pass. And then the everlasting kingdom of the Lord will manifest on the earth for a thousand years. And then the end shall come. We also know that in Daniel chapter nine, that there will be a prince that will establish a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will cease sacrifice and offering. We will understand that there will be a temple built. According to Second Thessalonians chapter two, the uh, the Antichrist will be in the holy place, showing himself to be God. And this is the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of in the book of Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 15, where he says, and when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, let him who reads understand. We see this in the book of Daniel, chapter nine and verse 27, which is that prince, that antichrist, that beast, if you will, that will manifest himself in the middle of in, in, in the beginning of the week. But he'll make a covenant with many for one week, one week. One week in Bible parlance is seven years. So uh, what is the halfway point? It is either 1,260 days, also known as 42 months, which is three and a half years. And so at the middle of the week, he will cease sacrifice and offering. And that is Revelation chapter 13, where he will impose the fact that anyone that does not worship the image or receive a mark in his hand or on his forehead, uh, they will not be able to buy or to sell. And at that time, there will be great death among the people. You will see that the seven seals, if you go into the book of Revelation chapter five, uh, the the first four seals are the first uh, four horsemen. But when you get to the fifth seal, you're dealing with the martyrs of those individuals that will be headed for the testimony of Christ. And so that's that's occurring at the uh, middle of the week. And so for three and a half years, there will be much havoc upon those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast. They will not be able to buy or sell unless they uh, bow down and worship this image and receive the mark in his right hand or upon his forehead. And then after three and a half years, the second coming of the Lord will take place, which is the book of Revelation chapter 19. Now, here's another thing that we have to understand, and that is that during this week, there will be great wrath poured upon the earth. You will have the seven seals that will be broken. You will have the seven trumpets that will be sounding and also the seven bowls that will be poured out upon the earth. These are things are in terms of the wrath of God that will be poured out upon the earth. You do not hear much of these Bible prophecy teachers speak about the wrath of God being poured out upon the earth 
during that particular time. But but we need to include everything as far as the final week is concerned, because that is what's going to happen. So it's not going to be a time for the Jews to celebrate in terms of well, the Messiah is going to come and establish his uh, throne and, 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 and everything will be hunky dory. No, there will be a false Messiah, which is, of course, the Antichrist, which Paul spoke of in the book of First uh, Thessalonians, chapter five, and also in Second Thessalonians, chapter two. And, and so we, we need to understand it in the way in the way and in the context that the scriptures have given us and not leave out certain details just because we want to tie a nice little bow around this and make it all nice and and hunky dory for every for everybody. But no, during that final week, there will be great wrath that God will pour out upon the earth. But there will also be at the conclusion of all of this the establishment of Christ upon the throne in Jerusalem. And so uh, uh, let's be ready for this. Let's do these three things. Watch and pray and be ready because these events must surely come to pass. So that's the connection with the red heifer and the Passover. And we pray that you would take time out to study this out. Don't take my word for it. Uh, of course, there will be disagreements. There will be uh, opinions and arguments and things of that nature. I, I understand that because all of us have a, a piece to add to this. But it should be added in the sense that we should look at it from the perspective of the scriptures and stay with the scriptures. And those things which we don't have an understanding, we need to admit that we don't have the full picture and we don't have the understanding. Again, in remember what Paul said in the book of First uh, Corinthians, chapter 13, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We only have a partial understanding of the scriptures. We don't have a full knowledge of the scriptures. So therefore, as a as a good piece of advice, we need to humble ourselves and receive from those who perhaps may have a piece of the puzzle in terms of the scriptures so that we can understand the full picture correctly. We are to rightly divide the word of truth, not just go off on a tangent in terms of a narrative and assume that, you know, what I've received is it. No, 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 no. We only know in part and we prophesy in part and we only have a portion. We see through a glass darkly. And so we only have a piece or a portion of this and we should be able to share it with others, run it by other individuals so we would not run in vain. And when it jargons, if you will, not jargon, but when it uh, 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 shakes our uh, uh, our narrative, we gotta be able to humble ourselves and say, you know, that's something that I never per, uh, uh, understood before or I never picked up in terms of perspective. Perhaps you are onto something, but at the same time, we need to just hold on to the scriptures in terms of how the Lord Jesus Christ said these things would come to pass and simply watch, pray, and be ready. You've been listening to Prevailing Wood Ministries. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. <laughs>